of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among all peoples. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is also to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and gladness are in his place. Give to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory to his name. Bring an offering and come before him. O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Trouble before him all the earth. The world is so firmly established, it shall not be moved. Let the heavens rejoice, and let the earth be glad, and let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Our song is worship. for you are worthy of all the praise. We come tonight, Father God, to hear from you. We ask you, Father, to forgive us for our sins. We ask you, Father God, to bless us that we will reach heaven. Bless our prayers, bless our worship, bless our praises unto you. We praise you, Father God, for you are worthy. There is none like you. There is none that deserve it like you. And God, there is none who can answer our woes like you. We pray that you bless us tonight through your word, that your word, Father God, will become real to us, that we will run and tell men, women, boys, and girls about the root, the realness of your word, that your word will make a difference, that your word will bless us, and that your word will be carried on. Lord, we ask you to keep the glory, all the honor and all the praise, allow us to be beneficiaries of your many blessings. It's in the strong, mighty, powerful name of Jesus the Christ we pray, and we ask it all. Amen, and thank God. Yes, Lord. Praise you, 
your name. Hallelujah to the Lamb. We thank God for another privilege just to praise his holy name. Amen. Amen. He is worthy. And we've come to honor the one tonight who is worthy. Amen. Bless the name of Jesus. God has blessed us one more again to come and honor him. Amen. Amen. We're in Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. We ended up last week in verse number 33 in Acts chapter 10. We ended with verse 33. <clears throat> I want to reiterate what took place on last week so we can connect it to this week. Amen. Acts chapter 10, verse 33 is where we ended. So tonight we will begin at verse 34 and we will end at verse 39, verse 38 rather, verse 38. This, this particular book is divided into several pericopes, which is divided into sub pericopes. So we will stop at verse number 38 tonight. <clears throat> Remember now that Cornelius has sent for Peter, and there was a man who showed up in bright apparel and told Peter, told, told Cornelius rather, that Peter was lodging at Simon the Tanner's house. We're talking about Peter, Simon Peter, the apostle Simon Peter was lodging at Simon the Tanner's house and the Holy Spirit and this angel told him just where he was located. We told you on last week that God has the perfect GPS, that God has a way of blessing us and God points us directly to where we ought to be. The GPS that you have will take you all the way around Houston before they take you to Missouri City. They will take you all the way down 59 to get to Dallas. The GPS that we have does not really set us in the right place at the right time. It is a hit and a miss. I would even say it would do it 40% of the time it would take you to the wrong place and you are sooner or later get there. I mean, it will take you around the city of Houston to get the Astrodome. But God has a divine GPS that will take you right where you need to be, place you where you need to be, when you need to be there, at the time you need to be there because he's God. Such it is in the text when we find that, uh, that Cornelius was praying in verse number 36, verse number 30, Cornelius is praying, right? Cornelius is praying some 40 days, some four days he was fasting and praying, and around the ninth hour, then God answered. What did God say when he answered? Because if God's going to answer, he's going to say something, right? Acts chapter 10, verse number 30, what did, what did God, what happened here? He was praying and he heard, he heard what God had to say. God says, your prayers has been answered. Your prayers have been heard, and your arms are remembered. What are arms? What are arms? A-L-M-S. What are arms? Who's talking? Arms. Arms. Boy, I don't know why y'all take those notes. Arms. Arms. Not A-R-M-S, but A-L-M-S. Financial gifts. Gifts, right? So his prayers have been heard in his arms, meaning his gifts to other people. Remember, we talked about every missionary is giving and every missionary gives. And as the missionary gives, he expects nothing in return. Pastor Charles Stern says a missionary gift is when you give and you expect nothing in return. You don't go and tell people about it. Mm -hmm. True. You don't go and beat your chest about it. Mm -hmm. When you give alms, Jesus says, when you give alms, don't go around telling people. True. He says, when you pray, don't be praying like the hypocrites. Don't be praying like those who are repetitious. Don't be praying and giving alms like those who want everybody to know it. 
because the hypocrites pray out loud in public so they can hear people and people can hear them. Such it is with arms, giving arms, A-L-M-S, when you give gifts, don't brag about it. Don't talk about it. Don't even confront the person about it later on. Out of all I've done for you, and you gonna treat me like this? Mm -hmm. Did you do it so you can be bragging? Or did you do it so they can mistreat you or treat you well? Mm -hmm. Did you do it so you could bribe them? <laughs> so Jesus says, and, and God is saying to us, whenever you give something away, don't brag about it. Mm -hmm. Don't even tell your friends about it. Whenever you do something for somebody, don't even brag about it. Don't talk about it. So, so the angel says, God speaks by way of this fella in bright clothing. He says, your prayers have been heard and your arms are remembered in the sight of God. If your gifts are given with the right motivation, you don't have to tell folk about it. If your gifts are given with the right heart, you won't brag about it. Therefore, he says, your, your arms are remembered. Send therefore to Joppa and call Simon here, surnamed Peter. So he sent a delegation to Joppa. What was this delegation made of? Was it 10 people? Two, two other men, I believe. If it's not one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, it got to be the other one, right? How many men did he send? Three. How many? Three. He sent three men. Two of them were what? Servant. His servant. What was the other one? A soldier. A soldier, right? Mm -hmm. So remember, Cornelius was a was a godly man, a holy man. And holy folk want to hear holy gospel. Holy folk want to hear something holy. People who are holy want to hear more gospel than they want to hear gossip. Mm -hmm. You ought to want to hear the gospel. You ought to want to hear the word. Mm -hmm. So Cornelius want not only to hear the word, but he want his family and friends to hear the word. The Bible said when, when Peter got there, there were a whole lot of people there. It wasn't no small account. Because Cornelius invited people to come. Are you inviting people to hear the preacher? Are you inviting people to the Lord? Are you just showing up out of another box being checked? How many people showed up tonight just to check the box? How many people showed up tonight just to keep them hearing Pastor David's mouth? Hmm? <laughs> How many people showed up just to say, man, we, we got to get on out here and go out here to the church house? Or did you show up to hear from the Lord? Did you show up to hear the man of God? Yes. Cornelius invited people. I oftentimes tell you that you have more than one car seat to, because you can't sit in all of them. And therefore, if you can't sit in all of them, you ought to invite somebody else to come with you. Uh -huh. Many of us got five, six, and some of us got seven, eight car seats, and we're the only one riding down the road, just a good old boy having a good old time. Yeah. We ought to invite people to hear the word of the Lord. So I sent for you immediately, verse number 33, I sent for you immediately, and you have done well to come. And since you've done well to come, I have some people here to listen to you. What a preacher, what a revival, what a great opportunity to hear from the Lord. Therefore, we are all present before God to hear all the things commanded you by God. We showed up to hear the word of God. 
We didn't show up to hear foolishness. We showed up to hear the word of God. And since we showed up to hear the word of God, preacher, preach the word of God. And, and I, I admit that we all have our styles, we all have our tone, we all have our opportunity and our own personalities, but the essence of the entire message has to be the word of God. That's right. I hope you showed up to hear the word of God. Yes. I hope you tune in to hear the word of God. For when we hear the word of God, the word of God changes our lives. Mm -hmm. Verse 34, then Peter opened his mouth. When the preacher going to teach or preach, he got to open his mouth. <laughs> Demonstrations are good. Illustrations are great. But the word of God must be preached by the opening of one's mouth. You got to open your mouth. If you're going to teach, you got to open your mouth. Matter of fact, if you're going to teach or preach, you're going to have to be heard. Mm -hmm. It is just so frustrating to me. Every time you go to a function and somebody gets up to talk, they say, I don't need no microphone. <laughs> and every last person that said that Brother Miles need a microphone. Mm -hmm. I think it is just selfish. Yeah. We got folk online trying to hear you. And then when you get up there, you mumble without a microphone. And then there are those who have microphones that mark. Mm -hmm. People sitting on the edge of their seat trying to hear. Mm -hmm. The Bible says that Peter opened his mouth. In the children's Sunday school class, they hear this sometimes. What do they hear sometimes, Sister Whitlock? Sister Whitlock just waiting to tell us what they hear. Tell us what they hear sometimes, Sister Whitlock, in, in the Sunday school class. The youth here in the Sunday school class. Come on, Sister Whitlock, tell us. Open your mouth. <laughs> Open your mouths. <laughs> if you're speaking, it has to be clear. It has to be understood. You have to open your mouth. Open your mouth. The Bible says that Peter opened his mouth so that people could hear what he has to say. You, what you have to say is so valuable to God and valuable to the people, you got to open your mouth. Everybody has something to say. And usually people can say more things after the benediction than they can before the benediction. You can have a, a business meeting. People won't talk. They won't open their mouths. But they, they result in the parking lot ministry. Yes. They result in the foyer ministry. And you ought to ask, why didn't you say that while the business meeting was going on? Right. That's why we don't have business meetings, Sister Brown. We have vision meetings. And the vision meeting is to cast vision, to reinforce the vision, and make sure that everybody's on target with the vision. But you have to open your mouth. Peter opened his mouth, and he said, in the truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. Remember, I told you now, when this great sheet was let down, before Peter and all kinds of animals were on that sheet, and the spirit says to Peter, arise, slay, and eat. Mm -hmm. It wasn't about the food. Mm -hmm. It was about discrimination. It was about prejudiceness. God was showing Peter that the, the, the Jews and the Gentiles got to come together as one people in order to honor him. Mm -hmm. We have come to honor God. How can we honor God whom we have not seen? And we won't even honor and respect people that we see every day. That's right. The question has been asked. How can we love God whom we have not seen? And then we, we don't love the people that we see every day. Right. Peter says, I perceive. I perceive that God has shown no partiality. 
The reason why he came to this conclusion, because Cornelius did not make a difference in who he invited to church. He didn't just invite people who looked like them. He invited people of all races, all creeds, and all colors. Here lately, I've been, I've been really, really, really educated. I guess it was about three years ago. I thought race and color was just something they were putting on the paper. I didn't know that there was really a difference made between race and color. Did y'all know that? Y'all knew that, huh? I'm just late. I'm a late bloomer. On the application, it always says, regardless of sexual orientation, race and color. And I'm like, why they put race and color on here? Because if I'm black, I'm black. See, we're the only people that's been about 10 different things. We've been the N-word. We've been Negroes. We've been black. We've been African-American. And I'm just waiting to the turn of the center to see what we're going to become next. Are you with me? So we have to understand it's not about our race. Peter says, it's not about Jew or Gentile. I have come to the conclusion that you all have invited folk other than the people that look like you. How many of you other than Sister Woods know the name of New Beginning Church? The official name, Sister Woods, Sister Davis. The official name, yes ma'am, Sister Brown. The official name of the New Beginning Church. New Beginning Missionary Baptist Church. So Brown said, well, why ain't we calling that New Beginning Missionary Baptist Church? <laughs> because when you use the words together, Missionary Baptist, it suggests that we are all black congregation. So 19 and a half years ago, the first thing I did that almost got me kicked out was change the name from New Beginning Missionary Baptist to New Beginning Church. I mean, we had a deacon meeting behind that. I said, I said, Sister Davis, when you when you type up the program this Sunday, just make it New Beginning Baptist Church. Let's see what happens. <laughs> New Beginning Baptist Church. I had a meeting the next day. Oh, you, they say. You know, every time people say they say that's what they want to say. They say you'll change the name. So the next Sunday. I dropped it to, I took out New Beginning Missionary Baptist. Oh, man. There was a war going on. And I said, let's just make it New Beginning. And when I tried to explain, people didn't want to hear it. But God has a way of moving things and moving people. Because I never wanted to pastor an all-black church. I wanted to pastor a multicultural church. I want our church to look like the look in heaven. Amen. And I want the, 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 even the subliminal messages to be messages that represent heaven. So now at the state of Texas, we are still New Beginning Missionary Baptist Church. But on our logo, on our documentation, on our communication, it is New Beginning Church. Because we want to welcome all races. Peter says that he perceived that not only do you all not show partiality, you all are not prejudiced, but the God we serve doesn't show partiality, and he's not prejudiced. Now the question is, do we want to be like God, or we just want to be like we want to be? How do we want to be? We want to be like God, right? We don't want we don't want these little clicks coming up. You know, in the church, the only thing a click is a, a, a sanctified game, <laughs> an unsanctified game, really. So a click is nothing but a game. I got my posse, I got my game, and this is how I'm rolling. God wants us to accept other people. Verse 35 says, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. 
Look what Peter says. Peter says, you all have not shown partial, uh, partiality. You, you don't show favoritism because God doesn't show favoritism. God doesn't show partiality. And he, he says, this is what God does. God includes every nation. God includes people who fear him. And God includes those who work righteousness. And that's the group that God, God accepts. Look at what it says. Acts chapter 10, verse number 35. Peter says, God has included every nation. When he say nation, is he talking about the United States, Russia, China? No, he's not talking. He's still harping on our particular nationalities, our race, our creed, our color. God includes everybody. Why can't the church include everybody? Why can't the church get in her head that everybody can be saved? Everybody who fears God, everybody who works righteousness, everybody who is of every nation who fears God and works righteousness, those are the people that God accepts. The brother say he walked in a white church one day. And they started looking around. And they looked at him again. About five brothers zeroed in on him. And asked him to leave. And it wasn't in Bible Texas either. And, and then when they, you know, ignorance can't do anything but be ignorant. They don't even know how to put together a sentence to make you even feel like you, you, you halfway warning. We don't serve your kind here. That's not of God. And if the pastor supported, he's worse than the people. We include all people. Peter says God accepts anybody of any nation, any nationality, any race, creed, or color. God wants them to fear God. God wants them to work in righteousness. God accepts them. Church folk act like they're God. They act like that if, if you don't please them, you're going to hell. But God accepts people. God is concerned. Peter says, now I perceive, I've come to the conclusion that you all accept everybody. And not only do you all accept everybody, God accepts everybody. Isn't that awesome? God accepts everybody. Verse 36. The word which God sent to the children of Israel. Which word? The word that was sent to the children of Israel. Preaching peace through Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. The same word that God has sent to the Israelites through the children of Israel, he's sending it to us. And he says, this is the word which is preaching peace. The word of peace. We ought not be fighting everybody. I won't forget it. I never will forget it. Going to a funeral and having to be the, the officiator of the funeral and, and the keeper of the church and having to referee the family members at the church. Body laying out there will never move again. The mother of the deceased can't get along with the wife of the deceased. The wife of the deceased bringing up stuff at the funeral that, that caused a squimmage. Can't, can't get it out of my mind. Can't get it out of my heart. How people will just create fighting even at the wrong time. We all supposed to be grieving. And then they, they come up with the excuse, we all grieve differently. <laughs> you know, you can't tell me how to grieve, Reverend. Well, you grieve out this door. 
You agree on the other side of this door. If you cannot get to a point where you can accept family members in peace, you go somewhere else and grieve. Funeral ought to be a celebration. We say it all the time. It ought to be a celebration. But you know what? Sometimes it's a frustration. Some of the worst things you can see happen at funerals and weddings. The worst thing you can possibly ever see, it happens at funerals and weddings when both of them are supposed to be a celebration. Folks fighting, the funeral, the funeral can't get started on time. The wedding can't get started on time because people got odds with each other. The text declares that we ought to have peace. Peter says this same preaching that took place of peace through Jesus Christ. And if we have, the key is to have Jesus Christ in your heart. Where there is no Jesus, there is no peace. Where there is Jesus, there is peace. In my class on last night, I said to them that the devil is the author of confusion. And he does his job well. And guess what? Where there's confusion, there's no God. Because God is not the author of confusion. The devil is. Because the devil is author of confusion. Where there's confusion, there's no God. Whenever God is present, there's peace. There's joy. There's happiness. There's life evermore. Wherever God is, there is peace. There is the peace of God and the peace with God. It says, and we can only get this peace through Jesus Christ. You know, you can be happy. You can be, you can be happy, but you're not going to have peace until you get Jesus. Because Deion Sanders says it well. He says that he was going through things and, and he was scoring even on defense and he was playing baseball and he was playing football and he was the world's greatest at one time and he had not an inch of peace until he met Jesus, until he surrendered unto Jesus. He had all the money he could imagine, lived wherever he wanted to live, and he's not short on what he got to say. But he had no peace. And I, I contend that sometimes people that talk all over themselves, they're trying to hide the fact that they have no peace. That's their shield. That's their way, that's their way of shutting things out and shutting people out. That's the way of, of a bully trying to tell you, I'm hurting inside, but I'm going to beat somebody else up. The reverse is that's true. People who are quiet into themselves, you got to watch them. That's right. Because they got some things going on, and that's their shield. And they, they, they are just waiting to get out of people's way because they don't want anybody to push that button. Because if you push my button, you got a problem. I don't have a problem, but you have a problem. If you push my button, you got a problem. Why can't we just all get along? The damage is done. Why can't we just all get along? We can't get along because there's no peace. And there's no peace because there's no Jesus Christ. The bed that you lay in, it doesn't matter if it's a king size or a mat on the floor. If you have not Jesus, if you have not God, you cannot get a stitch or an inch or a second of sleep regardless of where you lay. Houses become a home when God is present. Beds become a place of rest when God is present. God, through Jesus Christ, brings us peace. The author goes on to say, in verse 26, talk about Jesus. He says, he is Lord of all. Peter, 
Peter makes the point clear that he's not just the Lord for the Jews. He's not just the Lord for the Gentiles. He's not just the Lord for black people. He's Lord of all. I'm so glad. I'm so glad that he's Lord of all. He is Lord of all to the point where we have to understand that we don't have a monopoly on Jesus. We're not the only one who can sing songs to him. We're not the only one who know how to worship him. Because when you worship him and praise him, you praise him in your own language, your own personality. Some people just hug themselves. I mean, they just rock and hug, hug themselves when they get happy. Some people wave their hand when they get happy. Some people do their dance when they get happy. Some people say, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, amen, when they get happy. But let me tell you, y'all do something when you get happy. Y'all not be the same old, same old when you get in the presence of God. Whether you're at home, whether you're in the shower, whether you're at church, there ought to be evidence that, that you know God and you are excited about him. And then don't, don't put it on your personality. You know, I, I just... I'm just cool like that. I don't have, I'm an introvert and I just can't do that, you know. I'm talking about the God that woke you up this morning. I'm talking about the God that puts you halfway in your right mind. I'm talking about the God who gave you food when you didn't have food, gave you money when you had more bill than bucks. I'm talking about the God that enables you to breathe the God who enables your heart to pump blood to every extremity of your body. Let me tell you, I'm talking about that God. You ought to get excited about him. And we ought to get excited about him to the point where other people know that we are excited about him. We got too many undercover Christians. Got too many Christians that plead the fifth. We got undercover Christians. We, we're undercover. We don't we want folk to know you know, we, we, when we pray at work, we put our hands over, over our brow, brow, like some, some issue to us. <laughs> it's funny to me that it's only when you're about to eat your meal that you're itching. And some of us that, that stares at the wall, we don't want anybody to know we're praying in Jesus. And we will not stop others to pray over our food. Even if you're in the most executive meeting you've ever been in, you thank God for what you have. I was walking at the Holman Street Church one day and I stopped at the end of the stairway, bowed, bowed my head. And Manson Bracey Johnson walks up and he says, man, you praying over your soda water? I said, man, it's going in my body. I'm praying over my soda water. I'm praying over my cookies. I'm praying over anything before it enter in because I want God to bless it before it goes in. And not only that, I want to thank God for another chance. Even if I don't need it, even if it's not good for me, God bless it. Don't, don't, don't be an undercover brother. <laughs> don't be an undercover sister. Don't plead the fear when it comes to God. Be, be, be like the man on the side of the road, blind by the man and said, Jesus, son of David, come on by here. I need you. Jesus, son of David, of the most high God, Jesus, I need you. Don't wait till you need him or you think you need him or your life confirms that you need him to understand that you need him. You better call on him as a, as a regular custom. You ought to thank him as a regular custom. He says he is Lord of all. He, said, he says this Jesus that I'm talking about, this Jesus the Christ, Jesus Christ himself, he is Lord of all. He is no respecter of person. He does not show favoritism. He does not show partiality. Because if he showed partiality, most of us in this room would not be saved. 
Because we don't deserve it. We're not good enough. I remember as a Boy Scout, we used to sleep in the woods. Now, you know, snakes and I don't get along. But we would sleep in the woods and go fast asleep. Everybody sleep. Even the scoutmaster. And the scoutmaster at that time were all men. Even the scoutmasters were dead asleep in the middle of the night. And God kept the snakes away. Because he knew if I saw one, it was going to be him or me. And if it got close to it being me, I was going to leave the whole troop out there in the wilderness. If I can't get the upper hand on him, if he sees, if I see where he's about to get the upper hand on me, I'm going to leave him alone. We went to sleep, sleep, dead to sleep, slobbing sleep, snoring sleep. Didn't worry about a thing. God just all night. And all day, the angel of the Lord kept watching over because he is Lord. He is Lord of all. Verse 37 says, he's Lord of all. That word you know. That word you know, which was proclaimed throughout Judea. And began from Galilee. After the baptism, which John preached. Check it out. He says, that word, you know. That word, you know. He's coming and he's preaching the word of, of, of peace. He's preaching the word that was preached by Jesus. He's preaching the same word that gives us hope. Does the word give you hope or you just show up to hear it? You just read it to hear it or you just listen to it to hear it. The word of God gives us hope. Man can live without food for 40 days. Man can live without water for 40 hours. Man can live without air for seven minutes. But man can't live two seconds without hope. That tells me tonight that everybody in this room, everybody on our broadcast, every one of you still have some kind of, just an inkling of hope left. And I stop by to tell you, hold your hope. Hang in there just a little while longer. Don't give up hope. God is still present. God is still moving things in your behalf. And he's working behind the scenes. The Bible talks about the Holy of Holies where God is and, and the priest would go behind the Holy of Holies once a year and plead the case of the people behind the Holy of Holies. The, the curtain was there. The veil of the curtain was there. And, and Jesus died on Calvary. And when he died, he tore the veil wide open. And now because the veil is torn, we don't have to wait on the preacher once a year to go behind the veil. The Bible says we can go boldly before God for ourselves. We can go boldly. We can go with confidence and say, God, I need you right now. God, I messed up again. God, I made another mistake. Matter of fact, be honest with him and say, God, it's the same mistake I made 20 minutes ago. It's the same mistake I made last week that I told you I wouldn't do it anymore. God, here I am again. The songwriter said, it's me, it's me, oh Lord. It's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not my mama, not my daddy, not my brother, not my sister. It's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. And I thank you for hearing me because you are Lord of all. My sinful self, I'm coming to you again. Lord, I messed up again. Have you ever prayed that prayer? Lord, here I am again. I am done, Lord, I have done it again. I messed up. And not only, God, did I do it again, I did the same thing I told you I wasn't going to do. The same thing that caught me up last time. Keep keeping me, keep tripping me up this time. Lord, I need you like never before. It's me, oh Lord. Standing. That's, that's when you, you gotta have, you gotta have a mentor. 
You have to have a mentee, and then you have to have a friend that can hold you accountable. I mean, friends that you don't mind sharing things with, friends that won't judge you, friends that'll say, now you know you're doing the wrong thing. You know, that doesn't make any sense. Now, come on, man. Come on, sister. Jesus is Lord. He's Lord of all. She says, you know the word. You know this word, and it's the same word that was proclaimed throughout all Judea. He starts off talking about Galilee. Then he talks about Judea. So he's tracking the steps of Jesus Christ. He's saying that Jesus has set a godly example for us. Jesus has set a good example of what the preacher ought to be talking about and how the preacher ought to go from one place to the other. He says he went throughout Galilee proclaiming this gospel and be, began from Galilee. Went throughout Judea and he began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. Check this out. Jesus ministry was only three years. He went through the process. Preachers today want to announce their calling today and begin preaching tomorrow. <laughs> the Apostle Paul sat in the wilderness, got along with God for three years. Jesus lived 30 years and then after 30 years he gets baptized and he spends three years preaching the gospel. It says we must be prepared. We don't. We can't be novice. What do I mean when I say novice? What do I mean? We can't be novice. What does that mean? We can't be novice. What does that mean? Yes, ma'am. Inexperience. Inexperience. We cannot have inexperience and think God going to use us. You got to go through some things. You got to try some things and fail at some things and Get back up and try some more things or try the same thing. You cannot be a novice and walk and teach and preach in this world in the 21st century. Some preachers think it's so attractive. Some young people think it's so attractive on Sunday morning. How the preacher gets up and he does this, he says this. And they think it's so attractive until they they do just like they do. They act like they do. They, they, they speak like they do. Their whole countenance changed. The whole person began to look like somebody else. One brother, one brother that I know, he, he listened to a preacher, and that's when we had CDs. He would listen to, I mean, uh, cassettes. He would listen to the cassette over and over again, and he would hoop the same place the brother hooped. He would moan the same place he moaned. And then when he write his notes out after he listened to the cassette over and over again, when he write his notes out, he says, who right here? Everybody needs somebody to hold them accountable, to tell them when you're wrong, to tell them when you're not doing it the right way. And then we need to be an example to somebody else. We need to mentor somebody. After the baptism, which John preached, you remember Jesus being baptized? And when he was baptized, heaven opened up. A voice came from heaven. Who do you think that voice was? There was a voice. Jesus goes into the water. The Bible says they go into the water. John takes Jesus down into the water. And when he comes up out of the water, the Holy Spirit descends upon him as a dove. And then there's a voice from heaven that speaks. Who do you think that voice was? It was God the Father, right? Now you have the Trinity at one place at the same time, and he reveals himself as three in one. You have, you have God the Father speaking from heaven. You have Jesus Christ being baptized. And you have the Holy Spirit lighting upon him as a dove. Three in one. There are not many places where God reveals himself as the Trinity, but this is one of them. God said, this is my beloved son and whom I am well pleased. Is God pleased with you? 
Can God brag on you? Can God set you apart and say, this is one that's going to always do it right? But we're pure pressure. Pure pressure. P-U-R-E. Pure pressure get to you. Or will peer pressure, P-E-E-R, will it get to you? There's that pressure will burst a pipe. There's that pressure, pressure will burst a pipe. And he was saying that to let us know, do not be condemned or submit to your peer pressure because peer pressure will burst a pipe. It'll make you do some things that's out of your character, especially when you're trying to please people. So he says, he says, says to us tonight, he says, it was at the baptism, after the baptism, which Jesus of Nazareth was baptized. Verse 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil for God was with him. Something about Jesus, right? What are some of the things he says about Jesus? First of all, he says, God anointed Jesus. When did he anoint him? When he came straightway out of the water, the Holy Spirit lit upon him like a dove. It is the anointing of God. God was well pleased with Jesus. He anointed him. First of all, he God anointed him. Who did he anoint? Jesus the Christ of Nazareth. There were a lot of men named Jesus. But when you call him Jesus the Christ, there is no one like him. There's but one. When you call him Jesus of Nazareth, there is no one like him. He's the only one. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit. Talk about the baptism. He's, he's anointing him with the Holy Spirit. The people saw the dove light upon him. The Spirit light upon him. He's anointed. And Jesus says that I'm anointed to preach the gospel. He says, you know this word. You already know this word. God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit. And with the Holy Spirit comes power. Someone stand and read Acts 1 and 8 for me right quick, real big, with your outside voice. Acts 1 and 8. He says that God anointed Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit with power. God anointed Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit and with power. Go ahead, sister. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You will be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria. Samaria. Indeed to the ends of the earth. Amen. So when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will have power. Mm -hmm. mass power. Explosive power. Dynamite power. <laughs> and you will witness. He says the Holy Spirit lights upon him and he is anointed and he has power. And after the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus, he went about doing good. You can tell when somebody has been anointed by the Holy Spirit. I'm not talking about when they get in Colosseum lines and come down the aisle. But you can tell when someone's been anointed by the Holy Spirit they go about doing good. They become a verbal witness and they become a non-verbal witness. They go about doing good. Have you done good here lately? What have you done for God lately? Have you been going about doing good? You have the power. You say you're saved. You say you're born again. If you're born again, you have the Holy Spirit residing in you, living in you. That's why I always tell you, the Holy Spirit is not going to hit you. <laughs> Boy, that Holy Spirit, first of all, is not a that. 
He's a he. He's intelligent. He's the third person of the triune God. He is the intelligent God. He doesn't have to hit you. He doesn't hit you. He lives within you. Songwriter says, he walks with me. He talks with me. And he tells me that I am his own. He, the Holy Spirit, lives in us, resides in us. And if you get excited about him, it's all right. He ain't going to hit you. That's terrible English. He's not going to hit you. He resides in you. He fills us. He blesses us. I want to make sure I, I say this the right way. The Holy Spirit walks with us, lives in us, and he comes in without all this demonstration. He's not coming by anybody spitting on you. God knew COVID was going to show up. He's not, he's not going to be present. He's already in you when you're saved. He's not going to be present just any old kind of way. He, it's all right to lay your hands and people are healed, but the demonstration is not what, I mean, the, the illustration, the exaggeration and all that, that concerns me. What am I talking about? Somebody tell me. What am I, am I saying the wrong thing, the right thing? What am I talking about? That it should be observed that you have the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. just trying to make it evident. You know, one of the worst things you can do as a man or a woman is try too hard. Don't, don't try so hard. Just, just let it happen. What am I talking about? You don't have to put on a charade to make folk like you. You don't have to get excited, so excited until you lose your character in order to get to know somebody. Children are losing their lives because they don't have enough likes on social media. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit lives in you. He anoints you and you go about doing good and you have power to do good. Jesus had power to do good and power to be healing people. And he delivered those who were oppressed by the devil. People who are oppressed by the devil. The devil make them think that they are nothing. The devil make them think they ought to just end it all. The devil gets their attention and the devil start talking to them. And the devil want you to, to lose a good life. And let me tell you, anybody that's listening to me today, your life is worth living. Don't give up on God. God has given you power he has given you the ability to do good things. God is one to deliver you from the devil. The devil wants to oppress us. Some people are oppressed because they got too much stuff. I tell folks, don't let your blessing become a curse. Some people, since they got their new house, they ain't been in church since. They volunteer for overtime. Because they got to pay for that car, pay for that, that new dress, pay for that purse, pay for those shoes. They got their new stuff and now they ain't got time for God. Don't let your blessing become your curse. Yeah, that's right. don't, let it, don't let it happen. Don't let it happen. You trust God. When you trust God, you expect God to deliver on your behalf, even if the money is funny. God, this is your prayer. God, I am going to do what's right for you. I'm going to go to church. I'm going to spend my time with the Lord. I'm expecting you to handle this business. God handles it well. I mean, when God does it, he shut the devil down. Because if you if you work so many hours just to get ahead, sooner or later, if the devil doesn't shut you down and walk off and leave you, your body will walk off and leave you. If you don't get some rest, your body will shut flat down. It will shut down. It will just say, oh, you don't have sense enough to shut down? You don't have sense enough to, to stop? I tell you what. I'm out. Mm -hmm. yes. 
And the same folk that cheered you on won't even come and visit you. God delivers us from the oppression of the devil. The Bible says finally in verse number 38 that not only was Jesus anointed, not only did the, the, the Holy Spirit reside on him, not only did he have power, not only did he heal people, not only did he do good, but God was with him. Isn't that amazing? When God is with you, he's more than a whole world against you. Just stay with the Lord. Trust God. Don't give up on God. God hadn't given up on you. God gave his son Jesus just for you. That's why he gave his life. Not only was he anointed, not only was he baptized, not only was he doing good, but Jesus died on Calvary, rose from the dead, and he's present today. I want to announce to you, he's here. Amen. The door of the church is open. Amen. Invitation is extended. You got to trust God. If you never received Jesus Christ as your Savior, this is your moment. This is your opportunity to trust God. Believe that he's the Son of God. That he died for your sins. That he was buried in a borrowed tomb. But he rose from the dead. And the Bible says if you can just believe the story that Jesus died and was buried and rose from the dead, you can be saved right now and you qualify for heaven. Not that we are so good we qualify, not that we've given our lives so well that we qualify, but we only qualify through Jesus. Peter says we have peace through Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus the Christ. If you've never received Jesus, you take this moment, bow your head with me and invite him into your life. Let's say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. Jesus' name I pray. Amen and thank God. And if you're here and you, you struggle with stuff, with confusion and there is no peace, I want to pray with you and pray for you. Lord, we come now, Lord, giving it all to you. We pray for peace. We pray for deliverance from frustration and chaos. We pray that you keep us now, Lord. Lord, we ask you to stay the hand of the devil. Stay the hand of the devil, Lord. Stop the hand and the movement of the devil. Grant us peace, peace in our hearts, peace in our lives. Lord, grant us peace. Give us hope, Lord. Give us strength. And bless us, Lord, that we will walk with you, that we will trust you. We will give our lives totally to you. Bless us to get along. 
Bless us to have peace. It's in Jesus' name we pray and we ask it all. Amen and thank God. It is offering time. It is time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. It is offering time. It's time for us to give to the Lord. If you want to give electronically, you can do so by giving by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com is our Zelle account. If you want to mail in your gift, please mail it in to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That is P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. We want to continue to pray for Sister Lydian Darrington. We pray for Sister Lydian Darrington. Are there any other prayer requests or praise reports? Are there any? Prayer requests or praise reports. God been good to anybody in the room? Pray for me. We're praying for Sister Cora Woods. Amen. Amen. Please remember to register to vote. If you need voters registration cards, I do have some in the office. Stop by tonight and pick them up. And we want you to vote for Proposition 9. We're voting for Proposition 9 that teachers will get raises and even retired teachers will get raises. We are praying for Proposition 9 and we are asking you to vote for Proposition Proposition 9. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for being a part of our service on tonight. Please join us on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. for Sunday school. Join us at 10.30 a.m. on Sunday for our worship service. And thank you for joining us tonight at 7.15 every Wednesday night. Please join us every Wednesday night at 7.15 for Bible study. Let us stand to be dismissed. Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We come now praying, Father God, that you continue to walk with us and bless us to be a shining beacon light for the world to see. Bless our church, Father God, that our church will continue to reach souls for you. Bless our church, Father God, that our church will be what people need to see in Jesus Christ. Now, Lord, we ask you to dismiss us from this place, but not from your presence. We come lifting up Sister Cora Woods. We ask you to touch and deliver and strengthen as you can, and that you will, Father God. We pray for Sister Lydia Darrington. We ask you to give her relief from pain and bless her, Father God, that she will be totally healed, even better than before. We ask you to bless in the name of Jesus. Lord, we pray for Reverend Eli Johnson. We ask you, Father God, to keep him, strengthen him, develop him. We ask you, Father God, to raise up his door down here. We ask you, Father God, to give him peace and strengthen him to stand and proclaim your word one more time. Lord, we pray, Father God, that you continue to walk with us and bless us that we will not be a respect of person, that we will not hold partiality, that we will not show favoritism. Bless us now, Lord. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, unto him the only wise God, unto him be power, glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us sing together. Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed.